Welcome everyone to uh, our, this afternoon's presentation at Almost Heaven Star Party 2019. Um, our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Darren Todd, uh, whose training is as an Air Force combat meteorologist, which says he knows about the weather that's going to actually affect you, not the weather that you're supposed to get or what the people in the central computer place said you might get but how to interpret weather into the local environment, something that might be called microclimatology. Um, he had that career for quite a while, and now he's moved on to another career, which is in electronics, I guess. Network security. Network security. So uh, he's doing something different. So you are no longer authorized to blame him for anything that you might observe outside. He has credible deniability now. It's <laughs> a past life. Uh, but he's going to talk to us today about the relevance of meteorological uh, prognostications for uh, amateur astronomy. So with that, please welcome Dr. Darren Todd. Now, uh, I'm put over here. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I was, um, you know, we'd, we'd actually kicked this idea around a few years ago. When I first came into NOVAC around 2009, and I went to the first uh, uh, Almost Home, and at the time I said, you know, someone should cover astronomy weather uh, and and uh, we kicked it around. I kicked it around with Phil Wary, who's uh, who has passed on uh, re recently. But uh, uh, and then I left. I, I left the club for a little while, and I came back. And uh, when they were talking about speakers uh, a few months ago, they were talking about, hey, you know, we should have this covered. And, and I said, you know, I really like, have been talking about this for the longest time because uh, weather is such an important part of what we do as am amateur astronomers. I mean, it. it uh, you know, uh, you know as well as I do that when you buy nice new equipment and you say, oh, I'm not have looking forward to this. And sure enough, when you buy new equipment, it actually summons the rain gods. So, um, and so I wanted to go and, and, and uh, not talk about the weather because we're not going to be learning how to predict the weather and like that. Uh, what we wanted to really talk about was how it affects you and how you can maybe, uh, you know, some, give you some tips on how to prevent uh, the effects of weather. There's only so much we can do. You can't really avoid clouds from appearing, but... Uh, you can, uh, you know, fight dew and things like that. So this is what this is going to be about. Uh, and we're going to talk about what causes it, refractory indexes. But uh, what I wanted to point out before we get into the presentation too much is that a lot of information, is, there's a, very, a lot of information on here. That's going to be available in the presentation. I don't know what format they're going to provide it. Uh, but we're not going to go through all of it. I've got 37 slides on here, and that's a lot of information. So we're going to be blasting through a lot of this stuff really quickly. So don't, don't fear. I'm not going to give you death by PowerPoint. Uh, Oh, so, uh, so uh, and here's the today's topics. We're going to talk about clouds, uh, uh, airflow dynamics, uh, uh, dew. I, I don't know if you have an S if anybody has an SCT, dew is a constant uh, enemy, mortal enemy. And uh, so uh, we want to talk about those kind of, some of the tools you can use, some of the weather apps we have available to us now uh, that many of us are already using. Uh, this is my, uh, we talked about what I did before. This is uh, what I did for the first 12 years I was in the Air Force. Uh, and uh, most people, including people in the Air Force, don't know that there's actually a combat weather team. Uh, and uh, the combat weather team actually deploys the SEALs uh, and the Army Special Forces. And so uh, we get to do all the fun things, uh, going out and rafting, uh, skydiving, as you can see, doing lots of push-ups. I don't do many of those anymore. Uh, and, uh, and I used to be skinny like this guy, but not so. Uh, that was a thousand pieces and a couple of blown knees ago. Uh, and these guys right here are, are deploying a weather radar. And on his back here, he's got a radio, and he's actually recording, uh, he's uh, what they call a PRIC-177 radio, and he's actually uh, uh, sending the data information. He, uh, he'll be talking to the pilots on the aircraft. Uh, a lot of times the Army units, the ar even the artillery units in the Army, when they're firing these artillery uh, pieces 25 miles away, a lot of times those ar artillery pieces will drift left and right uh, due to the, the effects of the weather. Uh, so if you have high winds, even a lot of uh, uh, moisture in the atmosphere, those can affect where it lands. And of course, if you've got guys in the field, uh, and they're calling in artillery, that something that's very close to them. It's a big concern to them, obviously, that the artillery piece should land on the enemy and not themselves. So that's kind of what uh, combat weather is, is they, they go out there and provide that information. Now, this field this year is just now, uh, no longer exists any, anymore. Combat weather is going away because weather uh, forecasting within the Air Force has gone to a, uh, gotten to a level now with, uh, they hope anyway, that they can provide that micro uh, uh, you know, forecasting uh, uh, from, you know, using satellites and whatnot. So, so I'm, a, I'm a dying breed. That's okay. I've been out of it for a, a few years now. And uh, so this is what I did. I actually started off in the 70s when I was a wee kid uh, and uh, 
uh, didn't buy my first big scope until after I retired from the Air Force. Uh, and, uh, and then that kind of leads to what I was going to talk about here, the 2011 AHSP disaster. So I actually had brought th bought this really nice uh, CPC 1100, 11-inch 11 scope uh, in 2008. And the first time I really had a chance to bring it out was in 2011. And we had a, a it wasn't a microburst, but it was a really, really heavy storm one night. It was the last night of the star party. And it was over on the yellow lot. And uh, these winds hit, and they took my tent down. I, I just bought this new, nice $500 tent. And it shredded the tent and, and knocked my scope over. And I felt really stupid because I should have known it. Uh, but, but I wasn't really paying attention to the weather. And I think we, we kind of take it for granted sometimes that somebody else is watching it. And sometimes, uh, you know, uh, we think we can look at a forecast Stop. maybe for Clark. Stop. Yeah. Sometimes we, look up, we, can, uh, we can look at a, a forecast uh, and, and, uh, for Clarksville, for example. But that forecast is at a lower level than we are right now. Uh, so at Clarksville, I don't know what the altitude is at Clarksville, but we're at, uh, we're at over 4,000 feet here, 4,060 4, feet. So uh, the weather forecast down there is going to be different for up here. I'm also a mountain climber, and uh, a lot of times when we go out to Mountain State or, uh, uh, Washington State to climb mountains, we get the forecast, local forecast down there, but if you're 10 or 12,000 feet in the air, the forecast can be markedly different because the cloud levels are different. Even yesterday, when we see the clouds, uh, the, the forecast for Clarksville, uh, and you see up here, you're, you're a couple thousand feet above them, uh, and you're actually in the clouds, as you see them floating by us yesterday. So uh, that's why I wanted to focus on, you know, the, a little bit on today, we'll talk about the disasters, the potential for those, but that's really not uh, our, our main focus today. What we're going to talk about is uh, uh, things that could help us to, to uh, improve our chances of getting better weather and how to fight issues so when you're out there in the weather. Uh, we talk about uh, why do we care? Um, uh, you know, NASA spent uh, two billion dollars on the Hubble Space Telescope uh, to get away from the weather. The atmosphere has a very profound effect upon how uh, how our, our viewing or seeing conditions. So, uh, as you know, uh, when you look up at the twinkling stars, the twinkling is because of the atmosphere. And so, uh, NASA has spent these, uh, these these large sums of money, and, and especially on the James Webb, if they ever get it finished, <laughs> you know that that's going to be out in space. We don't have to worry about those effects. We, as amateur astronomers, cannot escape that, obviously. So, uh, you know, we have to focus on uh, on how to deal with what we have. Now, um, one thing I pointed out here is uh, temperature inversions. A variance of only two uh, two degrees Celsius can really affect uh, the, the how things are within the, t the telescope tube itself. We often tend to think of the, uh, the effects of weather being something that's ab ab up above us, you know, uh, two, three, five thousand feet, when in actuality a lot of the weather that's affecting your seeing conditions are within the telescope tube, or even if you have a truss tube, it's right above the mirror itself, and we're going to talk a little bit about that too. Uh, and uh, what I point out here on the bottom is weather is actually far more important uh, than sometimes we, we, we spend a lot of time uh, money on eyepieces. But in reality, uh, weather has much more profound effect upon our ability to see some things on many nights. Uh, and I go through some negative effects of weather. Uh, we have some, some aberrations here with the, with the formatting going from PowerPoint to uh, uh, Adobe, but uh, I apologize for that. But yeah, uh, uh, these are some of the negative effects that we've, uh, we can see from the we weather. Uh, you know, Excessive moisture buildup on, on, you see that a lot. Wind destabilization, if you're ever out there trying to look at something, uh, especially if you've got a high power eyepiece in there and it's just wavering <coughs> back and forth. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, obviously uh, what we saw in the li last night, the conditions can be for yourself very uh, miserable. So even if your weather conditions could be good, it could be just really miserable to be standing out there doing it can really destroy your, uh, your evening. Uh, and batteries can also lose power. Uh, uh, I've noticed my batteries on a really hot night uh, uh, tend to go uh, a little longer than they do on cold nights. I think the different types of batteries last a little longer from what I've heard. I've not really kind of measured that. Uh, we talk about the uh, unpredictability of weather. Uh, we've, if you guys have been around AHSP for a few years now, you've seen there's been a, two or three uh, bad storms over the last decade or so that have come out here. And I know that I, I wasn't here in 2017, but I heard it was a really bad one hit then too. Some of you guys were there for that. And uh, so, um, you know, and, and it's a frustration for everybody. It's a frustration for weather people too. Uh, that unfortunately, as much as we like to predict weather, as much as we have these great computer models, millions of dollars of equipment, sometimes you just can't gauge what's going on in the atmosphere. 
And a lot of times, even w what we saw yesterday, when I was standing out in the field and I was looking at some of the uh, clouds overhead, the weather people were saying we weren't going to have any severe weather. And as I was pointing out, when we were standing out there, I was seeing up, uh, looking up and I was seeing the clouds roiling up there. And that told me there was more turbulence than the, what they were suggesting. There. So they weren't being able to see that, whereas visually I could see there were some issues going on and I thought there was more of a chance of violent weather. And so I actually put my scopes inside doing that. So if you get to learn a little bit of that, it can help you out a lot in determining whether the, whether the weathermen are right or not, because they're not really looking at a micro level. They're not looking at you know, the specific field. They're looking at Clark's field. They're looking out you know, over a 20, 30 mile period, uh, space. So uh, when you look at the weather yourself, then you can gauge a little bit more. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, uh, I talk about complacency. Uh, what happened to me in 2011, that was complacency. I wasn't watching the weather forecast and I got caught off guard and nearly destroyed my, my scope. Uh, and I said on the bottom, never a trust weather person, that includes me. So whatever I'm saying right now, just throw it off, off the window. Okay, um, I talk about pro proactive weather management. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm also a pilot and um, and one of the things we talk about before pilots, you always make your plans before you leave the ground because when you're, air, when you're in the air, it's too late to make your plans. And so I kind of like to apply that to things like this. When you make your plans, when you're going out on a, uh, a star watching, obviously you, you want to make sure that you're, uh, you know, you're, you're doing your planning beforehand, making sure you're checking the weather then, make sure you've got everything with you that to deal with the weather, having a jacket with you. I know a couple of guys I, I heard up on the hill yesterday said, I didn't even bring any warm jacket for this. And so... Uh, you know, I, we get in a hurry of thinking about, oh, well, do I have the eyepieces I need? Do I have the scope I need? Do I have this? And they forget about themselves sometimes. So you have to really work. It. So, um, and I talk about ways here uh, uh, using apps, checking your forecast, and then continuing to check it because forecasts, as you've seen, could just change here, especially uh, really quickly. Uh, this is talking about weather atmospheric properties. We won't go in too heavily into all this, like the, 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 different, the, diff the three different effects that we have uh, in weather. Uh, uh, so this is what happens with light as it travels through the atmosphere. And we really only talk about essentially three effects. It passes through, uh, it is dispersed, or it's blocked. And, uh, that, uh, and of course, the, when we talk about dispersed, we're talking about really bending or refracting the light as it passes through the atmosphere. The, the atmosphere itself is not really doing it. It's water droplets. I mean, there's a, it's at a very micro level. Uh, and so that has, uh, has the profound effect on what you're seeing conditions are like. A lot of times when you look up and you say it's very nice outside, but then you get a look at the eyepiece and it's not as nice as the night before. Even though there's not a cloud in the sky, it's because there's a, lot, there's a lot of variances in the amount of moisture in the air and other effects. Temperature inversions and things like that. Um, here we go into seeing conditions. This is actually going to talk about astronomical seeing. This is the dictionary definition of astronomical see uh, seeing, uh, if you want to review that. But we're talking about basically uh, the different point, the point sources and how the upper atmosphere, as you get into the turbulent layer, then you start having to run into the problems with perturbed, uh, perturbed wave fronts. And the, as you get closer and closer to the ground, you get more of effects of the temperature uh, and more moisture content. So that's when you start running into issues. If you were able to put a telescope, theoretically, at 60,000 feet, your views of the sky would be wonderful. But unfortunately, we all live in this area down here, and that's where you start running into the issues. Uh, and here's, uh, this is actually a, a, a picture of what an air boundary layer looks like. You can see the roiling there going on, and that's what you're seeing when you're seeing the tinkling, uh, the, the twinkling of the, uh, uh, the, you know, when you're looking through your eyepiece or when you look up in the sky right now. And uh, uh, another definition there, you, again, you can look that up online. And this is uh, the atmospheric properties, and this is what they talk about a refractory index. If you look on the applications, a lot of the apps now that come on the phones will talk about your seeing conditions, and they talk about uh, laminar flow, the turbulent flow, and they talk about scales. And this is the scale they use. So when you're looking at a star, and this is a theoretical star, this is not an actual star, but you're looking at a star, this is the uh, refractory index they show. So on a really good, on a really good night, you're going to see something looks like that over there, and on a really bad night, you're going to see something that's more on this end of the scale. And so that's when, they, when you look on those apps and they'll say, see, when it's talking about the seeing conditions ratings, they're talking about this right here. What they're, what they're predicting is your ability to see that night. It isn't always correct. I've found that sometimes they'll say that the scene is going to be really good uh, and, and say that they're rating at five and it, the scales can be different from one app to another, but they'll rate it at five and sometimes I'll be seeing, uh, you know, two or one. So, um, but I, most nights it does work. Uh, and this talks about refraction, how light is broken up. As you see, you have a, a, a pure white light as it hits a prism. Or in this case, we're talking about a water droplet in the sky uh, that it breaks down into the different elements of that, of that color. 
And so that's what uh, that, that refractory index when water drop is high in the atmosphere uh, it does have effect on your seeing conditions and degrades your seeing conditions. Uh, and another effect is the convection, as I was talking about earlier, the convection at the ground level here and as it rolls up and down. I like to tell people all the time, think of the atmosphere as um, more like a, a pizza oven. You know, when you roll, open the oven up and you, at first the air is pleasant and you get that blast of heat, that's kind of what's going on. A convection oven uh, is doing that very thing. It's moving the, the air around so that it's getting a constant flow of e even air. Well, it, in the air outside, it's constantly rolling. Even on a really clear day, if you were able to see the air, you would see this convection constantly going on. And on a good day, that convection has no, uh, no real strong effect. On a bad day, that convection, though, is, is having a really heavy effect upon uh, the seeing conditions. And uh, this is what I talk about the inside climate, what I was talking about before, inside your telescope tube. Um, it depends upon the type of telescope you have. If you have an SCT like I, I have, both of mine are SCTs. They have a, 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 a plate of glass on the front that's, that's concealing that tube in. So the, the inside conditions of the tube are not as affected. However, you do have that corrector plate on the front that is affected, so you know you still have to deal with the same issues. But a lot of times if you have a closed tube Dobsonian, uh, that inside tube kind of protects the atmosphere inside the tube so that you get a little bit more consistent seeing. That's not always true, but I mean, I find that to be true. Truss tube dobs, dobs uh, you know, are affected in, in a different way, but uh, um, every, Telescope, I always say every telescope has its advantages and disadvantages when it comes to being able to, uh, uh, and so you have to develop a technique for your telescope that works well to, to get things heated up uh, to prevent that air boundary layer from affecting your seeing too badly as well as keep, uh, combat the dew. Uh, and this actually is, a, I don't know where this comes from, I've seen it all over the internet for years now, but it's talking about the air boundary layer. If you look at the mirror, uh, the primary mirror in this telescope, you can see the conditions, the wavy conditions are just above the mirror and it starts to get really wavy here. And when you're looking up into the sky um, and you're thinking, oh, the, the lights are twinkling, you're thinking the atmosphere is really bad, you're, you might be seeing a great deal of your, your effect is, being, is happening relatively close to the primary mirror in your telescope. Uh, and so that's what that tube helps to do. It helps to even that out so that you don't experience a whole lot of this waviness inside the telescope. So you can see this just as easily as you can see something 10,000 feet in the air. Okay, now we're going to get into clouds. Now, I, I, somebody was asking me this yesterday. Um, if you, you've probably heard weathermen say this all your life, a cumulonimbus. Uh, these are the, I actually put together a, a, a brief. There are, I think, 32 types of clouds, if you want to go and take a look at it. But uh, each one of them has a name, and you even hear names that are momatus. You don't really, you, you don't really see this very often. Uh, everybody's heard maybe wall cloud. If you, live, if you lived in uh, Texas or Oklahoma or something like that, they have wall clouds. That's where the tornadoes spawn out of. Uh, lenticular clouds are way up top. It looks like a lens. So when you think in Latin, you know, lens, lenticular. Uh, and here's the, the combinations of names, uh, how mixed clouds are. So for example, if I say, I see a lot of cumulonimbus clouds, which are usually your typical rain clouds. So if you look at here, you see cumulus, vertical developing, and uh, where's nimbus at? Uh, right there, a rain sheet. So vertical developing rain sheet. So uh, and those are the ones you see that are going up in the atmosphere. You'll see a lot of times they'll start out really low and they'll climb to about 45,000 feet. And those are the ones that turn, traditionally turn into uh, violent weather. Now, when I went out outside yesterday and I was looking at some of the lower clouds that didn't bother me in the least, but I started seeing a big thunderhead building over here and I saw it climbing up. And it was climbing at a very rapid atmosphere. That kind of gave me some alarm that we might have a little bit more of an issue. Uh, involving, and those were cumulonimbus clouds. Uh, but you, you, if you ever uh, watch a, a weather report at home, you'll hear some of these uh, uh, higher clouds. And yes, they have a, a particular look to them. Once you get used to it, you can actually pick out each cloud and say, well, that's a zero stratus cloud. Uh, but that's really not a function of what they look like so much as where they're formed in the atmosphere. Todd, yeah. Mm -hmm. Upper right, you've got the altitude modifications. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so what I, what I, this is just examples over here. This, I put two of them together here. I put the cumulus and the nimbus down here. And so I'm just the ones that you'll hear often. Yeah, that's what that is. And here's an actual, um, uh, I, this is the NOAA's classification. I think they have 32 classifications of cloud types that they've spotted. Uh, I've seen it as much as 38 different types of clouds. Um, that's just for your edification. I don't really, uh, I'm not going to go into all that, but 
there is a cloud chart you can actually look at. So when you look up at the clouds, uh, you, can, you can go to the chart and you can find a lot of these in there. Uh, and here's what I was talking about a few minutes ago. What I was seeing yesterday was a cumulonimbus. This one over here, this is CB on it, and you can see the, uh, the rain at the bottom there, obviously. They develop really low, and uh, uh, generally speaking, when a cumulonimbus, uh, the, a, a violent thunder thunderstorm is developing, they begin low and build rapidly up. And so you'll see them climbing 45, I've seen them as high as 60,000 feet. They climb really uh, very rapidly, and they can be become very violent, especially when you're out west, uh, right prior to, the, uh, the, just before you arrive at the no Rockies, when you get in what they call Tornado Alley, those areas out there, uh, the storms get a whole lot more violent. Uh, and of course, the nimbostratus is, you'll see that a lot more in the winter time. In the winter time, the, uh, when, the, when the temperature's a little bit colder, and the, it'll, fog, the, it'll be fogged down towards the ground. You know, you have those ruddy days where it's constantly, you don't see the sun for weeks, so you'll, you'll see a lot of nimbostratus and, and uh, snow clouds. And then, of course, you get into the higher up atmosphere, you'll see the cirrus and cirrus stratus, and those, those, those long, wispy clouds you see that are way up there, the ones that seem to hang there forever because they're moving. You think they're moving slow, but it's just because they're so far away. Uh, you know, they're up uh, at a very high altitude, so you're, th you think they're not moving at all, which I think they, they tend to hang out wherever I'm trying to look at. But, uh, yeah, that, that, those are the clouds right there that you'll see, the wispy ones uh, uh, that we've seen a lot of here in the last couple of days. Okay, and this is what I talk about the clues. So this right here, you can see here, this is a cumulonimbus formation. You can see the lower forming right here. And you don't see that darkness you usually see, but that usually comes as a, as a, a reflection of the amount of clouds. So when we say that brown cloud or that blue cloud or that black cloud or whatever, those it's just a reflection of how much cloud cover there is. It's really not actually that color, as you guys probably know. Uh, and so right now you're seeing a grayish cloud, but as it starts to build and the cloud density increases, then you're going to see it's going to look very dark and ominous. Yeah. And this one's building very rapidly. You can see right here, as it's moving up, you're seeing uh, what we call Virga. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a layer of, actually there's rain that happens. It rains down a little ways and then it'll get formed, pulled back into the crowd. It'll never, it'll never, never reach the ground. And so a lot of times it's raining and you'll never even know it. But at those higher levels, it could be snow and ice. Uh, different things can be uh, roiling around up there. And that's also what will sometimes become hail because it'll roll around for a little bit of while and it'll develop hailstones. Uh, and of course, I'm actually talking about how w what you would see um, based upon that. So that's why I talk about the cumulonimbus. So I'm giving you guys a, a, a kind of a quiz there. Uh, here's another one. Uh, so this is zero stratus. So we talked about that, that, that classification a few minutes ago, zero would be where in the atmosphere? Anybody? Yeah, very high, yeah. I see the, the, the right, the, this is, I tell you, zero, zero stratus are, are some of the best clouds you can, set, you can get camera pictures of. I don't know why, I run into zero stratus clouds all the time, and I've seen, look, I, I have actually have a, a, and I talk about the ice crystals they're made of, because at that higher level, of course, the atmosphere is very cold up there, so there's never going to be any rain up there at that level. There's not going to be water moisture at that level. It's all going to be ice crystals at that point. Um, and uh, you can see that's a very striking picture. I saw a couple of those on Thursday night. It's a beautiful cloud level. And matter of fact, here's one right here. This is a, this is a beautiful picture that comes out of those, you know, late afternoon. Uh, this is also cirrostratus, the ice crystals that are forming. It's a lens, uh, uh, a lensing effect. Yeah. You see that rarely, but uh, I've seen it occasionally here and there with the ice crystals. You see that a lot of time in the winter time. Okay, and now we're going to uh, weather and terrain. Uh, with with, uh, you know, when we're talking about weather, uh, we always tend to think about uh, things that are two to three to 5,000 feet up. And actually what, uh, where we're standing is a lot of times having a profound effect upon the weather. On Thursday, I think Thursday afternoon, we were looking at clouds just off to the mountains here that had a bowed under feeling on them. It was rolling like this. And that was actually because the, the, the ground level underneath it was pushing air up and it was kind of pushing up on the bottom of the clouds, you know. So uh, the ground that you're on has an effect on the weather. Uh, so, uh, what we talk about is when we talk about weather and terrain specific tips, we're talking about how you can use the terrain f to your, uh, uh, your advantage, uh, where to place a telescope. Uh, there's a way to play, uh, there's a place to telescope, there's a, lot of, a lot of people tend to, when they're going to put a telescope on top of a mountain, they put it up on top right on the very peak. But you're also catching the wind coming off the bottom, uh, off the valley sometimes too, so you're getting that ramped up effect of the uh, wind coming off the valley. So if you sit just slightly off peak. And if you look at observatories, and I've noticed this, I went to visit Mount Palomar a few years ago, and they don't put the, the actual observatory right on the very peak. They'll just they'll go off-center it by a few feet, and that makes a world of difference. It'll make a much more a bigger difference with a, uh, a telescope on a tripod.
because uh, you know it's so. Uh, and we're, we don't have any real true peaks out here, but I mean, if you're on a if you're on a mountain top, obviously uh, you might run to that kind of uh, condition. But uh, I give some tips here that talk about how to uh, um, to you know avoid weather issues, weather related issues, as well as uh, uh, using color filters. And everybody, I, I, I got them years ago, and I, you probably have received these these sets that'll have all these color filters that most people will promptly never ever use. They'll use the eyepieces, the color filters are, are those annoying things you have to move out of the way when you're trying to get your eyepieces. But those color filters can really help you to see things sometimes that you wouldn't otherwise see. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a science to it, I don't know at all. I, I, I do know that I find that, that an orange filter and a blue filter uh, helps a lot of times when I have a, a high uh, ice crystals in the air, uh, there's a high lot, a lot of cirrostratus clouds. The orange will, s will penetrate that a little bit more. I don't know why. I just found it over a period of time. I'm like, oh, that really works. So th those eyepieces, those, those filters are really handy. Uh, and there's, there's online uh, uh, tips. I've seen them on YouTube, as a matter of fact, that talk about that. Um, here I'm talking about uh, uh, cold air um, uh, uh, flowing into the valleys uh, and destroy see, seeing it early morning hours. Um, so the... the Obviously, throughout the day, there are different conditions. In the morning hours, I found that in the morning hours, um, uh, you know, higher ground is always better in the afternoon, lower ground in the morning, uh, and uh, and always try to be avoid being downwind of of uh, a mountain. I know that one individual not that long ago had asked me he wants to build an observatory, and, but he has a mountain about a mile away. And I said, well, that's fine, as long as you're willing to accept the fact that that mountain is going to have a, a profound effect on how your observatory was able to build a, a permanent observatory. Uh, so I said, as long as you're, you're, you're willing to accept that there's just going to have a lot of effect on, on how your, your seeing conditions are, but the terrain I is a very big effect on us. Okay, everybody loves to do. And, uh, you know, if you've been here H HSP for a few times, uh, do is uh, uh, not only an enemy to your telescope, but everything else. And... Uh, I get dew on the inside of my tent when my tent's been sealed up all day. So, uh, dew is a really big issue here, and uh, in most places, uh, dew is. Um, when I lived in Florida, it was a really bad de deal there too, near the ocean. Um, so I talk about the, the effects of dew here, the hazing that we get on our mirrors, the uh, fogging, whatever you want to call it, um, and uh, of course on the mirrors. The mirrors, the, the your main issues are going to be your collector plate, your mirror and to a lesser extent your eyepieces. So we have to heat those. If you heat them just a, uh, a degree or two above the ambient temperature, then that'll have an effect on how, how uh, little or much the dew is uh, going to collect. Um, some scopes have more issues with dew than others. Uh, so I talk about newts, daubs, and refractors, SCTs. I know that being an SCT guy myself, dew is a mortal enemy for that on that corrector plate, so I always heat my primary. And uh, I always heat my, I heat my primary up as well as my corrector plate. Um, and, uh, you know, it can also have an effect on when you're packing it up. Obviously, when you pack it up, you don't want to pack it in there with a lot of moisture on it, too. So uh, what we do a lot of times, uh, bring a towel, you know, and, and wipe it off here and there. Uh, but you don't want to, you know, be, be delicate with it. You don't want to throw off your, you know. Okay, so what is due? Uh, not that due. <laughs> Uh, so it's concentrated water vapor, as you know. Uh, uh, when air cools and uh, against a surface, and it's a pr puzzling thing. If you've ever been, I lived down in Florida for years, and I'm a glasses wearer. I'm wearing contacts today, but I'm going to walk outside, and instantly I get this, psh, you know, and you can't see a, a darn thing in front of you, right? And that high moisture in the air that was always prevalent in Florida, it's it's prevalent here too. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we heat up the surface. So a lot of times heating up the surface uh, of the uh, of, of your glasses or heating up the surface of your mirrors and your telescope is going to uh, fight that dew developing on that surface. So uh, so that's what we're doing when we're talking about the fighting dew. We're going to heat up the surface just slightly and this is the calculation of the dew point. Uh, as you can see it's a, it's a very sophisticated calculation uh, and uh, I'm going to walk you through guys through that right now. I'm just I'm just kidding. <laughs> I couldn't do it now anyway, so. <laughs> well, or you can use, I have an a, a dew calculator. There's actually a dew point calculator you can use to, to calculate it. You can go here and you can enter in the three, it's like three calculation of points that you have added in there and it'll come up with your dew point. Uh, if you care about that. I, I've gotten lazy. I use the apps. Because the app will tell me, is there going to be a problem with dew tonight? And it'll tell me, if, e I even like the app. But there's one app I use that says a smiley face, a, a flat face, and a frowny face. I like that. It's easy. 
Okay, so uh, here's some weapons for fighting dew. Uh, you guys have probably run into most of these, dew shields uh, and dew bands, you know, the, the, what they call astro zappers, uh, but there's uh, Kendrick makes another nice one too. Um, ins insulating, I use uh, some foil insulation around the outside of the astro zap sometimes. Um, equipment covers, uh, you're know, covering up the telescope uh, for a little while beforehand before you actually begin your, 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 your viewing. Uh, Electrical equipment housings for the electrical equipment themselves, because a lot of times you, uh, I've heard a few people lose laptops overdue out here. Uh, get down inside the electronics. Um, of course, you know towels and uh, corded uh, hand dryers. If you use a hand dryer, make sure you use it from a good distance. You don't want to hit uh, your uh, your primary mirror, zap it with a, a, a hair dryer from uh, you know two inches away. Uh, so I've, you know people will stand off with it about two or three feet away. Just give it just enough of a boost. Uh, and early setup. Um, what I do with my scopes is I will turn it on, uh, I'll turn my uh, do zappers on like an hour before I even begin viewing. That way I'm uh, ahead of the game when I, when I actually sit down and, and, and start my viewing. Uh, here's some tips for managing do. Um, keep it cover, uh, covered, um, uh, having your equipment ready beforehand. Uh, uh, the people who rush up and, and start at 5.30 and, 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 and sunset is at 7.30, they start putting up their equipment at 5.30 and getting all their photography and they're in a rush. I like to just get it all ahead of because you won't forget a lot of things. So uh, get it up and early and get your zoo zappers working and that'll, that'll help you to fight it before the battle begins. Um, and use desiccants. I use a lot of, you can buy them on Amazon. Those little desiccant packages, you know, they tell you not to eat. Uh, you can buy those on Amazon, bags of them, and I throw them in all my equipment boxes and that helps to keep it after you put it back in the box, you don't have dew sitting in there ruining your equipment because it will make things rust. It'll get into certain areas and won't, it'll make uh, and it'll it'll ruin your equipment. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, also dab instead of white. If you're actually dealing with your corrector plate, you have to be really careful because you can scratch those corrector plates. And they're very expensive to replace, uh, or and you're not going to mess with your primary mirror at all. Okay, and I was talking about this a few minutes ago. This is uh, uh, different uh, terrain effects. Um, if, you've, uh, if, if, you, if any of you have ever lived near a mountain, you'll see actually clouds that are sometimes formed directly above a mountain or uh, near a mountain. And those are actually lenticular clouds. What, what is happening there is that the turbulent airflow below the mountain here is, is, is the hot air is coming up in there and it's actually uh, creating that different, you know, we talk about the lenses, how the lens, uh, heating up a lens keeps dew from forming. The, the different temperature inversions create clouds and, the, and because the mountain is, is, is making it flow down into that valley with the colder air a lot of times, what will happen is that will create the lenticular clouds and so it, it does have a lens effect only because of that bump in the air that we see over the top of the mountain. Um, and this is talking about uh, dressing. So um, what we wear, make sure that you bring layers of clothing. Uh, I will definitely wear a jacket out, uh, uh, bring a jacket and, and a couple of layers. Uh, so as we, if, as, as, it either, as the night either warms up or cools down, uh, then we can, uh, you know, we can take off and put on what we need to uh, and prepare for all possibilities. Because you, as you guys know out here, we never know what's going to come. Hand warmers, uh, a lot of people use the hand warmers on this, especially on the newts and the dobs. Those work really well. Just throw it on top of there and it, and it heats up the, uh, the tube quite nicely. Uh, Weather applications. Okay, the, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the, the one applications on your phone, your laptops, or whatever that you can use, uh, and you can look on there and um, and find out. It, it boils down all this um, information we're talking about here. You don't have to learn the dew point. You just say, hey, what's it look like tonight? They're so easy to use. I've, I'm spoiled by them. I can't do this stuff anymore, only because I, the weather apps they have are so nice now. Uh, I have an Android, but uh, there's really good ones that work on iPhones and Androids. There's probably I would probably say there's a, at least a couple dozen of them at this point uh, 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 that have proliferated over the last few years, uh, and they're and they're not just uh, they're not just weather apps. Question. Yeah. Which ones do you like best? I'm going to get into that. Yep. I'm going to talk about some of the the ones that I've ran into. Uh, again, I'm, I'm my my personal experiences with Android apps, uh, but I think that most companies will develop them on one platform or the other, and then port them over to the other platform. Uh, and here's some recommended apps, uh, as a matter of fact. So uh, the ones that I've heard are really good on, on Apple are the Scope Nights or a Good to Stargaze. And, uh, uh, and this is actually a really good one. I like this one because it actually gives you a really simple boil down. It's telling you here your chances of rain, uh, what, are your, what are your scene conditions for that night, and, and specific to a locality. So you can put in your locality on the app, and it'll tell you what your temperature is going to be. And it's really, and it's telling you right here. It says it right here, Saturday night, Sunday night. And it's actually... Uh, 
providing to you a, a, a basic layout of what, uh, what your sunset is and what your scene conditions are likely to be that night at that locality. And, uh, and the one for Androids up there, the one that I use is a uh, Astrospheric. That's a really good one. Uh, and it, this is available also to uh, uh, this one's These two are available on Google Play, uh, and this is on Medial Blue at their actual website. Uh, and then the, uh, these down here on the App Store. Is the App Store still up and running now? I think it's good. Okay, I, I know they were talking about. Uh, the top three are also on the Okay, yeah. yeah. The top three are actually better than the Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, we were talking about this yesterday. You have an anemometer with you. Uh, I don't know if you have it with you by now, but uh, uh, it's a little device that you hold in your hand, and you can literally hold it up, and it gives you uh, some information, uh, wind, uh, temperature. Um, some are just wind variants, but uh, uh, another thing that people will use, sometimes if you have a permanent observatory, they'll use the wind socks. You've seen the wind sock. It's literally a, it looks like a big, you know, they use them at airfields, too. You'll see them all the time you go to the airport. Uh, and then the home weather stations. Um, you know, if if really want to, if you want to get into your own forecasting, the home weather station is a pretty handy way of doing it. Um, and I use it with a radio. I'm a radio guy myself too. Uh, and the NOAA web forecast is being broadcast 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You can always go on that NOAA, and it will give you the the weather conditions for that day uh, at that at that frequency. Uh, and that that that's useful. Uh, I wanted to point out here. You can use that anywhere. So I have, uh, I'm a ham radio guy. So I can get in my truck and get the NOAA weather for, for, for forecast, even if this Wi-Fi isn't down, which is never down. And, um, uh, but I can get in there and, and hear what the forecast is. So uh, that's pretty handy. And that's it for me. So uh, I, I want to open it up for any kind of questions anybody might have. Uh, I know I rushed through this stuff. I had 37 slides to go through, and I was kind of, yes, sir. I, one thing that I found very helpful, especially in cold weather, is hand controllers, especially Celestron and Need, they get very cold and the screen starts to fade. It's using hand warmers uh, rather than yeah. hand controllers. Oh, that's a good idea. And um, yeah. I found that very helpful. Yeah, I, I, you know, uh, the, it, the 24 years in the military taught me to keep my hands out of my pockets, but I had to kind of train myself to keep my hands in my pocket, and I put a hand warmer down in my pocket now, so yeah, I'll do this a lot. <laughs> temperature and batteries, it's a good rule of thumb for alkaline batteries, mm -hmm. Placing it on the ground, uh, the cold gets into the battery, mm -hmm. and it's unavoidable. So usually your capacity will drop by, say, half. Yeah, it's yeah. It's a good rule of thumb to assume that. Now, I I don't know. Maybe somebody else knows. Maybe uh, you know lead acid batteries are more affected than uh, maybe. Well, the lithium are not affected by. Yeah, that's what I thought. Don't have nine hundred dollars for a good heavy duty lithium. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with lithium. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know that I, uh, when I used to use the big marine batteries and I got lazy and I started going to the lithium batteries, uh, I did notice that I didn't have to worry as much about the, the power drain because when I used the marine batteries, I know that they would slot uh, and I was doing viewings at 20 degrees uh, uh, when I go to State Park at 20 degrees or whatever. My batteries seemed like they would sap really fast, you know, especially if I'm running the Astro Zaps or running them at a really high rate because I have one on the corrector plate and one on the, on the mirror itself. And with them running on high, you know, after a couple hours or so, I'm, I've lost 50% of my, my power already. Uh, whereas on a warm night, it would be at 70%, you know, not as bad, yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Clear Sky Club, you did mention that most club members have it on their phone and will check it religiously just uh, against other sources. Yeah, you know, there are, uh, and there's so, uh, there are so many apps out there now, it's just unreal. Uh, as a matter of fact, you go and type in astronomy in, in Google Play, I, I don't know about for App Store for Apple, so I apologize. But when I go into Google Play and I type in astronomy app, I will, there will probably be 50 apps will come up, and there are everything from compass apps to weather apps to uh, you know scene condition apps, is, and some that are specific and some that are suites of tools. Uh, the ones that I provided are suites of tools, uh, th meaning that they're going to have a whole lot involved in, in one place. Uh, you know, ones that involve scene conditions, of, and I think over the last few years they've gotten better about uh, conglomerating a whole bunch of this all in one. So I used to have 10 apps on my phone, and now I have just two because they're kind of putting them together and in, 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 in the big, so you have a suite of tools. Yeah. When they don't agree in regarding what scene conditions or? Right. So, 
so this is the this is the, this is what the this is the bane of m meteorology, and and what they're using are uh, forecasting models, and they're running these through very powerful computers, whatever, and they and these computers calculate uh, literally billions of calculations per second, uh, trillions in some cases, and they're making uh, running these models, and they'll run them several times over, and after they run these models a few times, they'll get what they what they'll determine they use to to make the prediction. Each one of those companies is getting their information from a different source. Some are going for the NOAA. Uh, National Weather Service, a lot of times they're, they're cross-feeding information and they're combining it. And so a lot of times if I'm looking at one app, I will go and consult another app because they might have a different take on things. If you've ever watched, and we actually make fun of this in the weather field, when we talk about the, the hurricane, the, the forecast, when they talk about the forecasted path. I lived in Florida and on Guam for a number of years because when you're working in weather, you tend to work in the crappiest places for weather. And so, uh, and, and I, was on a, I actually spent four months on the hurricane hunters, so uh, flying into the hurricanes. And uh, so uh, we, would, uh, we would look at the predictions, and, and, the, we'd, and you would see these paths, and most of them will line up in the same direction. But you always have that one that goes like, you know, that is telling you the hurricane is going to go to Antarctica or something like that, you know. And, and so th there's a computer model behind that. And so each one of those apps has a model behind it. Now, the best ones, we're going to combine several models and then kind of give you your best guess. Uh, but some of them will just go on one or two different models. Yeah, that's where your variances are. You know, uh, well, <laughs> me personally, I, I don't trust all the forecasts entirely. Uh, what I did yesterday is I have the actual NOAA ra radar on my phone. And I came up here, and I looked at the radar, and I saw uh, Thunderheads building. Uh, off to the west here I saw one, and I, I went back to my camp and took my scopes completely apart and dismantled them because <laughs> I, I didn't want to take any chances. Again, I had one taken away from me in 2011. So I tend to look on there and try to, uh, almost an intuition kind of a thing uh, because I don't trust weathermen. <laughs> just who I am. And so I, I would say there's nothing you can really, it's going to be totally reliable, uh, but I would say the best, best chance you're going to have is to make sure you check more than one source because one person will tell you, I mean, you guys have seen it, no chance of rain whatsoever and you get into a downpour or the other way around. Well, yeah, no, it's going to rain all day today and it's totally sunny that entire day. The models are not predicting it or they are predicting it and sometimes you just best to check two or three sources and make your best guess between them. Yeah. Intuition's the best way. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, earlier you showed an uh, example of seeing, and I think uh, you had five different categories of seeing. Yeah. And I was wondering about how often those might change at night. Because you'll hear this sort of long standing advice of, well, if you're mm -hmm. looking for your scope and you're not happy with the view, the seeing isn't that great, mm -hmm. stay with it for an hour or two hours because you capture the elusive rare moment yeah. of your seeing. So, what I always want to know about that is you're talking about moving from a three to a two. Mm -hmm. For how long? For a minute? For like ten seconds? I mean, for people who've actually done this, spend an hour, I've never been able to spend an hour or two looking at the same object. Yeah. But I've wondered you know, just how radical an improvement can there be for how long? I don't know. I think they average it out over a period of time. When, when you're looking at the, on the apps, when they talk about your scene conditions, I think they're going over that period of time. Over a period of time, it may be three to four hours. I've seen them for all night. I think they're giving an overall model. Uh, just. Just because uh, a lot of times you'll check the app and it'll say the, se the scene conditions tonight are poor, uh, but then you'll get up at two o'clock in the morning and it's crystal clear and the sky's fabulous or so. So they might have averaged it out over a period of hours. So I, don't, you know, like what I talk about, I don't trust apps either. So a lot of times apps will tell you, oh, it's going to be like last night, for example. The the model, everything I saw said that, that last night was horrible. People were telling me that they got up at four o'clock this morning. And the sky was absolutely phenomenal for a short period of time. So, I mean, so they're averaging over a period of time. But you know, there's there's no uh, there's no guarantee that what they're saying is going to be the way. That's why we all most people will stay around even tonight is showing really bad conditions. But we've seen it happen before out here where the conditions they're showing they're show poor conditions, and then all of a sudden we have this spectacular night. Uh, so yeah, I think it's averaging over time is what they're doing on those apps. Yeah. One anecdotal story would be Percival Lowell and his viewing of Mars. When he set up his observatory in Flagstaff, he would spend time at the telescope, and the same conditions would be mediocre, and then there would be periods that would just last for uh, seconds, sometimes, or a minute, where things would be crystal clear. 
and then it would go back to being degraded again. Yeah. So you're right, your patients can be rewarded, but just like the uh, slot machines in Las Vegas, you just don't know when that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Good things go to those who wait. <laughs> I think you, you alluded to it when you showed the turbulence and, and getting into some issues about that at work. Mm -hmm. um, and you talked about the fact that two tenths of a degree can make a difference. In the yeah. During the course of the night, the layers of cooling, or in some cases warming, but usually mm -hmm. cooling at different rates and creating different levels and amounts of turbulence. Right. Such that at any one time, everything can line up and work out well. And the, and the disturbances go away. Right. And, and then again, it will keep on cooling, and you'll be back into a different state of trouble. Yeah. And you don't know when it's going to happen. Now, if you have a turbulence coming off the mountain, mm -hmm. it's going to stay there. Yeah. And that, that leads me to a question I was going to ask you. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the professional exhibitors usually don't be quite on the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. But do they offset to the leeward side or to the windward side? Uh, you know, uh, that would be a question for the engineers who built the observatories, but I'll tell you that uh, what I understand, that uh, the trees in the valleys below a mountaintop, those trees will sometimes have a lot of dew content on them. And if you look at the wicking effect of air, when it blasts through that valley, it's going to pick up a lot of that moisture, and of course that's going to create a dew problem. So if, you're, if you live on a mountaintop or on the, on the windward side of the mountaintop, you're going to be picking up a lot of that. I've found that when I'm out here viewing and the dew content is really high, if I'm pointed in the wrong direction, it'll overwhelm my dew controllers. So what, I'll do, what you'll see me do a lot of times is I'll turn the other way for a few minutes to kind of let my dew controllers catch up and then turn back in. If I'm looking directly into the, 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 the wind and the dew content, or the moisture content is really high. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I think we've all noticed a, a sun, summer weather phenomenon in the D.C. area and in Westertown summer observing site. The weather forecast is clear, and in fact, it's totally clear. Night is clear, but at sunset, there's this thin layer of clouds that comes out of nowhere right mm -hmm. before sunset. People complain about it on the list, sir, and there's no way to know about it when you can't yeah. observe. Smog. Who, what the hell is <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 high atmospheric ice crystals could be the, the, the source. Um, I mean, I don't know. Um, it depends on what layer it's at. A lot of times, oh. if it's down low, yeah. I see that could be uh, dew off the uh, uh, you know uh, off the ground, uh, moisture content from there. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I I usually run into problems with cirrus clouds uh, because they are high atmosphere clouds because they're the highest refractive index. When I mean, you've got ice crystals, are going to have a higher refraction. Uh, capability than say water droplets uh, and so and they and they sit in one spot they're very uh, incessant they sit there and they just ruin you for, uh, for and they'll sit in one spot for the longest period of time but I've not really noticed that but then again I don't view in that area I usually go because I have I live in Ashburn and there's so the, the light pollution there is so exceptionally bad I don't even try to view there now if I get out to out west then I, it's phenomenally better but if you're actually viewing in in Fairfax or something like that um, I don't know it's a big Crockett uh, yeah. Camp High Road places like this. And you still run it out there? Hmm. Where you get this phenomenon. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hmm. No, I've not seen that. Hmm. I've seen it several times. All right. Hmm. Another good app is Windy. Which one? Windy is a Windy? web page app, and you can use the, the three yeah. big models, the uh, NOAA, European, and the North American one. You know what I'll do? I'll download like five of them at one time, and I'll use each one of them until I got to the point where I really like this one, and then I'll start deleting the ones that I don't really like all that much. You know, because everybody has a preference, right? Mm. Anybody else? Any questions? Would it be possible for you to um, provide a separately with a couple of those links to those programs and the software and that? That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I could do that. As a matter of fact, and I know I apologize. I rushed through this presentation because I didn't know how much time I was going to have. I started building this out maybe a couple of months ago. And so there were 37 slides there, and you're going to look at the, all this information up here. It was, I got pretty wordy. Uh, I'm very <laughs> verbose when I talk like this. But uh, uh, this information, and I thought that they said that they would put this up on the Novak website. We will do yeah. that, but just a couple okay. of other things. Yeah. Also I can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Uh, and it, all the stuff is not really necessary. Uh, I mean, just letting you know that there are uh, the, some basics of the atmospheric conditions, but uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff on the slides if you, if you want to, you know, everybody goes home and they pile all their gear away and say, okay, I'll see you next year. But uh, if you look through this stuff, it'd be really handy um, uh, on, on all of your observing, not just at the H AHSB. Yeah. That's all I have. Thank you. You guys like my boy band microphone here? <laughs> yeah. And I'm putting it in the for next year. Um, this year, I, each year I reached out to Matilda um, Danko from Clear Dot Scott, the Clear Dot Sky, and um, he said he wasn't able to make it this year, but he says he'll be retiring from Environment Canada, and he'll have time to come to Star Park mm. starting next year, and he put this on his list. So I hope that'll happen. It's not just. I, you know, we never believe meteorologists. And he's just a meteor actually he's a computer guy. But mm. he said he'll talk about sort of how they got started, mm -hmm. how it gets used, yeah. how they use the models. Yeah, and I was a combat meteorologist. I, you know, a lot of my stuff is uh, is very local to that or whatever. So you spend a lot of your time <laughs> learning about artillery and how planes fly and things like that. So, uh, uh, so if you guys are ever out wanting to shell somebody, just let me know. I'll help you out with the forecast. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> 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 Thanks, <laughs>